Eureka, a secret government town full of the smartest people in the world, all policed by a fish-out-of-water sheriff of average height, weight, and intelligence. Uh, scratch that, he's a bit thick-headed. So, now you're all caught up. Here's the top 10 Eureka episodes of all time. Andy? Yeah, boss? You said there was a bank robbery. Yep. Someone stole it last night. Number 10, All the Rage. What is that? An effigy? It doesn't even look like me. What are you doing about it? I'm trying not to throttle someone. Our first pick comes shortly after the season four status quo shakeup that found most of Eureka's main cast shanghaied to another timeline, where they all had to pretend they knew what they were doing in different jobs and with different relationships than the ones they left behind. All the rage follows nebbish punching bag Douglas Fargo, who, much to everyone's surprise, is the tyrannical head of global dynamics in the alternate timeline. Much like Star Trek, some of Eureka's best plot lines involve supernatural circumstances causing the cast to act out of character, be it brainwashing, body swapping, evil clones, or simulated realities. These out of character moments tend to give the cast some room to stretch your legs and really ham it up. So when a hate virus spreads to the building, we get to see our cast of type A heroes unleash their inner It's Always Sunny cast member. This episode also throws a bone to Fargo, a character who sometimes gets written as a joke in the show's lesser episodes. The rage plague first turns him into the boss from hell his alternate reality persona used to be, but we also see that he is the only one able to rise above the influence and come up with a self-sacrificing plan that saves the day. For a character who was so often the cause of the town's woes, it's a fantastic redemption to see Fargo risk it all to set things right. All this started with Fargo! There's a really effective B story where Carter has to dump a woman he just dumped in the other timeline because in this timeline he's moving in with her, now aware that their long-term relationship is doomed to fail. It's executed well with no melodrama. There's almost a sort of gallows humor as he tries to get comfort from his friends. Like, you can tell he's looking for excuses to not have to leave work and face the music. It's all very human. And a final side note on this episode, Eureka had a bad habit in the later seasons of using neutral, even TV lighting in situations where sinister, atmospheric lighting would have greatly benefited the scene. So, kudos to the team for giving us some mood lighting in this late game episode, even if it gets as stroby as the start of The Rise of Skywalker. Why are you so mad? I thought you weren't affected. I'm not. I'm, you're pissing me off. Well, I'm the head of GD, so you can shut the hell up and do what I say. Number nine, Oh Little Town. Thaggart sent. You just wrecked Christmas with two words. I never got the chance to talk about it in last year's abandoned Christmas TV project, but you better believe I'm doing it now. Yeah, I put a Christmas special on my top 10 list. Yeah, I know it uses a framing device to avoid questions about canon, particularly when it reveals Santa is real and he's Chris Parnell, but it's just a perfectly designed Christmas special for this series. Every character has their own relationship with the holiday. Joe uses Bah Humbug as a cover for her secret Santa gifts. Carter wants to get out of town and go fight with his folks. Taggart pioneers the field of Santology and Allison was apparently raised by Redditors. This all checks out. And on top of that, there's actually a unique case of the week. The town itself is shrinking. It's possible this episode made the list just because of the pun title. If you're not really invested in Eureka's characters or have a more cynical outlook on the holiday season, you're better off skipping this one. But if you want a lighthearted feel-good Christmas special, grab an eggnog or ten and enjoy. Personally, I usually have to balance out the saccharin with a Black Mirror Christmas viewing afterwards. But whatever you do, for the love of God, do not watch the other Eureka Christmas special. I give you my all, and what do I get in return? A firebomb, flattened, melted, blown up. Hey, shut up! Avoid it like the plague. On to the next one. You can't leave. I, I finally found you. I'm not quite sure what you mean, but don't worry. I'll be back. Same time next year. Number eight, try, try again. I can't turn it off. I can't open it up. Can't drop it? No, you probably don't want to do that. And it can't take back. In which Fargo is trapped in a force field with no off button and the field keeps expanding. There are episodes that stand out because they shake things up or tackle more cerebral themes, and then there are episodes that are just standard cases of the week. Try Try Again is your typical case of the week format, but every element is executed so well that it stands out as one of the best. You've got the typical escalation from intriguing novelty to personal threat to apocalyptic threat. There are multiple sci-fi gadgets that seem to just be world building, but later come into play as part of the solution. Techno babble, secret sinister motives, Fargo being horny for Joe, and Sheriff Carter saving the day using his everyman logic. But this one runs so, so smooth and does such a good job of building tension, all with some nice character beats for Nathan and Allison. Try Try Again is proof that you don't need to break the mold to be a standout episode, so long as you completely nail everything that makes up a standard case of the week. Sheriff Carter, 
You really tried to help me on my last day, and um, for that, I, I don't know how to thank you. That's actually quite tough. If only you were better at your job. Number seven, Lost. But Andy's going a bit overboard with the decontamination protocols. We've only been gone a few minutes. Yeah. You've been gone a little longer than that. They set out to travel to the planet Titan, but half the cast wind up traveling through time instead. Four years in the future, the spaceship crew have to deal with two equally disturbing new realities. That the people they love have moved on in their absence, and that the once friendly robotic deputy has made dozens of clones of himself and now rules the town with an iron fist. Even brainwashing troublemakers are people who attempt to escape. The majority of people chose to leave. Well, until they had the redaction interviews with Andy when they had a sudden change of heart. You think they were threatened? No, he thinks they were altered. This episode meets out its twists at a perfect clip, from the revelation of where the ship wound up, to the time skip, to the interpersonal complications of the time skip. Jack and Joe are hooking up, God's in his heaven, all's right in the world, suck it Zane. You have to be kidding me. You too. And finally, with a reveal of the AI brainwashing the town scheme. And after all that excitement, there's still one more twist up this episode's sleeve, but we'll address that in number six. I can't believe you thought appealing to my emotion would work. It's got action, drama, and a creepy fake nice automaton who wants to lobotomize an entire town. What's not to love? But the good news is, you won't hold it against me. <laughs> Number six, Force Quit. All of this is fake. The town, the people, everything except for the crew of the Astraeus, you and me. We're inside of a computer program. Surprise, surprise, the Rip Van Winkle spaceship was all a sham. Much like the Star Trek episode Future Imperfect, the simulated reality our heroes were sent to deliberately pretended to be the future in an effort to conceal any out-of-character actions their lifelong friends and lovers might demonstrate. I said shut up, as in close your mouth and stop talking. So now Jack has to find a way to send a signal to the real world from the virtual world. I wish I could say this is the exciting end of the Lost two-parter, but it was actually a three-parter. They did a one-off case of the week inside the simulation that was utterly pointless. It contrasts to mind the third season of Fringe, which also involved a character being brainwashed into thinking they belonged in an alternate reality. They did a few cases of the week in that reality, but a lot of people I knew abandoned the show at that time. It's, it's fake, why would I care about what happens in the cases? Well, in Fringe they did some extremely clever stuff with it. A villain who could predict every possible outcome of a situation was defeated because he didn't realize she was from another universe because, yeah, how would he predict that? And then as she starts to learn the truth, she still abandons her escape to save a child from the Candyman murderer, jeopardizing her own life. Don't get me started on the Candyman episode. All you people who jumped ship at season three missed out. By contrast, Eureka's fake reality case of the week offers up nothing. They invent a neck gun for a dragon born of the Matrix glitching. It's just stalling. Just go right to force quit. Get me to the good stuff. Evil Jack. Evil Henry. Evil Joe. Uh, okay, not so much Evil Joe. Evil Joe has to deliver some horrible Storm Frontier I am so evil lines. Fargo gets another real human moment when Jack lies to him about his girlfriend still being alive in the real world, so he doesn't fall into despair until after they've succeeded in their escape. That was a bit of a gut punch. All in all, this is the perfect capper to a two-parter that almost was and could have been. That's why I wrote on, on, oh, I, I wrote, um, great. This is a virtual hand now. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, um, ironic. Mm -mm. Number five, before I forget. The earliest pick on the list is the show's third episode, in which missing time events coincide with the arrival of renowned scientist Jason Anderson. It's most certainly not a mystery what is going on, Jason is erasing people's short-term memory to cover up his crimes, but the implications of a short-term memory wiping device become a lot heavier when Jason's co-workers realize he's been stealing their breakthroughs for years, and Jason's wife starts to question exactly what sort of relationship they have. Oh, wait for the team to make the breakthrough and then wipe them out, cover your tracks, and then ride in and save the day. Henry, what did he take from you? Why can't we remember if we ever even kissed? 
So now Jack has to race to save Jason the asshole Anderson from his own test before his wife's sabotage settles his hash, ultimately revealing Jason as a fraud and leading to his termination. Now, this was in the early days of Eureka when the show was written like the town was willing to kill people to protect its secret, so I like to imagine Jason's redaction involved redacting him to a black site. Before I forget, excels at something Eureka struggled with, which was effective villains. For the most part, Eureka was a man versus technology show, but when they did include villains, they went with a stupid mid-2000s trend of shadow organization with nebulous goals. See The Ring from Chuck or Fulcrum, also from Chuck. In Eureka, it was the Consortium, a sinister agency with no clear motive. In a late season episode, a throwaway line implies their goal is to invent time travel so they can prevent the invention of nuclear weapons. That's a pretty fascinating goal, and one that might justify the heinous acts they engage in, but since it's never explored outside of that one line, I can't really count it. They're just bad guys doing bad guy things, and you could transplant them from one show to another, it wouldn't make any more or less sense. That's why Jason Anderson was such a strong villain. Using a mind wiping device to cheaply steal the innovations of others, in a show that explores how innovation itself is worth so much risk, makes him a good thematic adversary. Unfortunately, we don't see baddies like him all that much after this. If you're interested in Eureka but have never seen the show, this is a fantastic episode to start with. Number four, Purple Haze. How's it work, anyway? It, um... It just does. God, do I really have to explain everything? The ultimate everybody is acting out of character episode. Something is causing everyone in town except for Jack to act on their most impulsive desires, and despite only being a season one episode, they already had these characters down to a T. Henry is put upon by being Mr. Exposition, Joe is tired of being a hard ass, and Allison just wants to jump Carter's bones for Pete's sake. The town's descending into chaos, although unlike the unrestrained brawl from All the Rage, this one plays more low-key and creepy, with the streets eerily silent by the episode's climax. We don't witness townspeople engaging in random violence much, but the implication that Jack and his daughter are terrified to leave their home while looking for a solution gives the situation plenty of gravity. And the real threat is under our nose the whole time. It's not who wants to fight who, or who wants to screw who, or who wants to spill the beans on who. This is a town full of mad scientists, and someone's bound to try doing something absolutely nuts once their own morality is off the table. So the gang stops Nathan from interacting with the unknowable artifact, just in time. Oh, natural. May I ask why? Why not? Unfortunately, that doesn't tell me if you've been affected or not. Number three, Noche de Suenos. God, I hope I got that right. In traumatic injuries, it's difficult to see the extent of the damage. And we won't know why he stopped breathing until I've done an autopsy. I'll tell you why. Because he died in a dream. A car crash and a- oh my god. A car crash and a toxic waste spill spur a series of shared dreams throughout the town. What starts out as genuinely funny to the townspeople, and is at worst just embarrassing, quickly begins to descend into chaos. Couples are fighting because they saw their partners dreaming of other people, students are flunked because they cheated on tests in their nightmares, Fargo fantasizes that he's Zorro saving damsel in distress Joe, and then things really escalate when people start dying in their dreams and then not waking up. Alright, <clears throat> everybody, uh, we're moving to global. Hey, um... Dad, this, this woman won't wake up. Unlike most random case of the week episodes where the perpetrator is some random doofy scientist who doesn't understand what their invention is really up to, the perpetrators this time are Nathan and Allison, attempting to use a dream machine to communicate with their son who is on the autism spectrum and has never been able to truly communicate with them. Now that they're finally getting through to him, they're willing to carry on their work in secret, even if it means risking the townspeople's lives. It adds a huge amount of depth to a case of the week that was already intriguing, amusing, and of the highest caliber on its own. 10 out of 10. But my name isn't on there. That's a good thing, Fargo. I know, because it means I wasn't the one who had the man in black dream. Well, it sure as hell wasn't me. Oh, God. Number two, Founder's Day. Where is he? He who? Carter. Once this one gets going, it just doesn't stop. Carter, Joe, Allison, Fargo, and Henry all get zapped back to 1947 and have to get back to the future. They're initially concerned with not changing any past events, but Joe, Jack, and Fargo pretty much light those plans on fire immediately. So now the name of the game is to find a way back to your own timeline before G.I. Joe locks you up 70 years in the past. It's zippy, exciting, and the sequence where Jack is almost left behind in the dance hall is, yeah, it's definitely a moment the show's been building up to for a long, long time. But the real payoff is when they make it back home. The last five minutes of the episode reveal that absolutely nothing 
nothing is the same. Jack just kissed Allison in 1947, but is now back with his ex. Joe and Zane went from almost engaged to hating each other. Henry is married to a woman he doesn't even know, and unlike with the ending of our number seven pick, the show never walks it back. This is their reality now, and it remains that way for the rest of the series. What an ending. Honorable mention goes to both the follow-up episode to this, where they give the alternate reality some scenes to sink in, and the mid-season finale after this. That episode completely throws the time travel rules established in this episode out the goddamn window. But it's a fun little caper nonetheless. Missed the top 10 list by just this much. I would rather us be stuck here together than leave either one of us alone. Everything. Just for luck. Always think of you that way. And number one, Phoenix Rising. You lived through four years of a timeline that was erased because you stopped me from doing the thing that created it, saving Kim. And the very fact that we're having this conversation means things are going to change. It's a very common narrative for people to travel back in time to change things, but what if you love your life? What if you don't want to change anything, but wind up back in time anyways? After Jack and Henry see the next half a decade into the future, before realizing if Henry's wife doesn't die, it will be the last decade anybody ever sees, Henry has to come to terms with losing his wife. Jack, on the other hand, tries to see the upside, suggesting they prevent future crimes and maybe invest in a sports almanac. But with every step Jack takes to try and recreate his perfect future, he winds up changing things. His rival was supposed to leave town, the girl he likes was supposed to go on her first date with him, and instead the day ends with her holding the rival's hand, begging him to stay. Every time I try to make things happen with Allie the way they did before, the more they change. To top it all off, people are now spontaneously combusting, and all signs indicate that this is no accident. These are murders, and Henry is the prime suspect. He couldn't save his wife like in the future he and Jack saw, so instead he's brutally avenging her death. While this isn't ultimately the case, we do learn that Henry is up to no good when he proposes using Jason Anderson's mind-wiping device to obliterate their knowledge of the future. The pain that you feel, knowing that you're not going to be with Allison, that you're not going to be meeting the child that you were having together, this takes all that away. Jack seems pretty hesitant, but Henry isn't exactly asking. You really going to do this? We have to. And who will go first? I'll make it easy for you. Erasing someone's memory of an entire lifetime they could have lived is a pretty heinous action. Henry starts walking the villain path this episode, and while he does do some shady things later on in season two, he never crosses any lines more serious than this one. There are a few Walter Whitish witch cell phone moments Henry has when under supernatural neurological circumstances, most notably in one of Jack's dreams in Noche de Suenos, but unfortunately, him wiping Jack's memory without Jack's consent never comes to a major I watched Jane die-esque conclusion. Still though, it makes for an absolutely killer ending to an absolutely killer episode. An easy pick for the number one slot. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. And I will never forget. So that's my top 10 picks for the best episodes of Eureka. If I missed your favorite, let me know in the comments. And if you're wondering what video to watch next, well, I'll make it easy for you.